गुड इवनिंग एवरीबडी टूडे वी आर इन कॉन्वर्सेशन एट द इंडिया फाउंडेशन फोरा एंड वी विल हैव अ डिस्कशन अराउंड पार्टीशन टूडे इंडिया सेलिब्रेट्स इट्स सेवेंटी फोर्थ इंडिपेंडेंस फ्रॉम द ब्रिटिश रूल दिस ईयर वी ऑल्सो मस्ट टेक अ पॉज एंड रिफ्लेक्ट ऑन वॉट हैपन्ड इन द पास्ट सेवेंटी फोर ईयर्स वी हैव ग्रोन इन टू अ स्ट्रॉन्ग नेशन वी आर द वर्ल्ड्स लार्जेस्ट डेमोक्रेसी टूडे डेफिनेटली दे हैव बिन मेनी हिट्स एंड सम मिसेज Today in conversation we have two very accomplished ex journalists members of the Rajya Sabha and formidable authors MJ Akbar and Dr Sopandas Gupta Before we begin on the real conversation around history uh, do you think it is relevant to talk about uh, partition the relevance of partition in today's times especially for the young generation Well obviously because uh, a visceral memory uh, lasts for generations its uh, political and geopolitical consequences are not uh, erased in one lifetime uh, and uh, if you look at uh, the reasons manner in which that uh, colossal colossal mistake was made then uh, you will begin to appreciate why precisely uh, it remains something that uh, everyone particularly the young generation who are in charge of the next 75 years of our country uh, must know and in fact it i must uh, before asking shopan to make his initial remarks i must uh, uh, i must say that uh, lots of people have forgotten the factual narrative of what precisely happened why it happened and what for me was the most fundamental lesson which i hope to discuss or which i hope to present a little later which was the whole partition idea and the people who eventually opposed gandhi within the congress the reason that they gave was that uh, partition would be a solution to the hindu muslim problem in fact as gandhi ji said over and over again it was the exact opposite it consolidated and it institutionalized the problem uh, whose consequences we are facing today uh i have very mixed feelings about whether partition is relevant or not in my youth and that goes back some time uh, uh there used to be inevitably around independence day all newspapers used to have supplements which one of the very basic questions which used to be asked was was partition inevitable could it have been averted i see less of that today except that among a certain section of the indian diaspora mainly in western europe who settled partition remains a very vivid memory not least for many of the muslim communities who were unsettled from uttar pradesh the only you know, the, the proverbial muhajirs who are uh, very unsettled in contemporary pakistan now the issue of whether this is relevant or not comes up in 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 sort of curious ways at one level we were one people who went our separate ways in 1947 today when we look 74 years later we are we are tempted to this unfortunate but inescapable conclusion that we have indeed evolved in very very different ways i mean there are commonalities but i think the larger differences between india and pakistan less so perhaps in bangladesh but certainly quite marked even there we have developed very very in in very different trajectories i think one of the uh, uh, They, for them both in bangladesh and in pakistan the question of nationhood is now established and settled so when we often ask this question was partition could partition have been averted and cease to posit it in a historical way i think there's one thing to posit it in a historical sort of way as to what exactly happened what were there sort of wrong choices made uh, were certain things absolutely in it did, did, did events drive the uh, the decisions a bit too much those questions are all right in a historical sort of bit but when if we try to posit it 
in a more contemporary dimension, I think we get into a lot of problem. I think uh, uh, in, in, at the best of times, a conversation between India and Pakistan is difficult. It becomes even more difficult if we raise the question of was partition inevitable and you ask the question, is, is your nationhood somehow suspect? So I, I, that, that's why I said I have very mixed feelings about this whole thing. You know, uh, just to take off from his point, uh, in fact, we have to address this issue slightly differently because there wasn't one partition, there were two partitions. Pakistan was partitioned, I mean, because of a very legitimate liberation movement by Bangladesh. A liberation movement which actually uh, exposed that the original idea of Pakistan as based on the principle of religion, right, was completely fallacious, right? I mean, the Bangladeshi Muslims are as much believer Muslims as anywhere else. The Bangladeshi Muslims have as much faith in Allah or anywhere else. And in fact, there is another element to it. Uh, he mentioned, I think, in a passing, it's a kind of phrase that we use in passing, that we went our separate ways. No, there are 200 million Indian Muslims who didn't go a separate way, who remain very much an intrinsic part of the unity and the potential and the dynamic of India. So, uh, in fact, the number of Indian Muslims today is equal to the number of uh, Muslims in Pakistan. So, we have actually, the community, because of what it did in 46 and 47, has managed to uh, sort of triple partition itself. Uh, once we get, now I also, but I take the point that Chopin is making, which is very valid and which should be addressed. Nobody here is challenging the sovereignty of Pakistan. It is a separate country and it can work to its own dynamics. Similarly, Bangladesh is a proudly independent country, a country with which we have had uh, very good relations and hope to have even better relations. So it isn't necessary that the memory of 46, 47, 48 na 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 should always impinge negatively upon our present relations. No, that's not true. And the uh, Indo-Bangladesh relations are evidence that yes, despite what happened or whatever, irrespective of what happened, rational, sensible nations can actually work uh, a, a good neighborhood policy. So. Yes, with these qualifications, I think we can uh, proceed. Well, I would agree and disagree again here. Because if you look at uh, the manner in which the people who migrated to Pakistan, as you see, there are two aspects to what composed Pakistan. One is a settled population which was there in Punjab, in Sindh, and the Northwest Frontier Provinces. And there was a large section of Indian Muslims who came from Uttar Pradesh, and uh, Hyderabad. That was what made up. Now, if you look, look at the Hyderabad and the Uttar Pradesh Muslims, it's a bit like what you see among the Irish or the Italians who migrated to America. You know, there are commonalities, but there are profound differences because the experience of what they've seen in the past 70, 75 years has been markedly different. The manner that the societies in which they've lived, their neighborhood, their larger social relations, have been very different. So that point is there. So while there are, while there are similarities, there are differences. And the point which uh, is very important to make is that a large section actually sincerely believed in their own minds, rightly or wrongly, that Pakistan was going to be the proverbial homeland for Indian Muslims. It didn't quite turn out to be that way, but they went there with a certain deg degree of idealism in their terms, in actually believing that that's the new sort of dawn, new utopia, which is going to be presented to them. The reality was, of course, quite different. At this point, you know, we have to mention that enormous irony of uh, what he has said, which must again, since we are bringing out all the points from the uh, subterranean levels of uh, uh, history, the the places where today Pakistan was being created 
are the very places which never actually voted for the Muslim League yes. in 37 and even after the false narrative that was imposed by Jinnah on the consciousness of uh, Muslims, a narrative of fear, Islam is in danger, if in, in, you know, India becomes free and we don't get our own country, every mosque will be destroyed, and so on and so forth. And a, a narrative of invective, a narrative that had no relationship to our past, present or future, but became a confection which had uh, absolutely incendiary consequences. There, even in Punjab, it was, uh, you know, the Unionist Party, which won, and even in the 46 elections, right, it wasn't quite defeated, right? The, uh, Jinnah had to actually do a direct action, repetition of what he did in Bengal in January 47, in Punjab, in order to then, uh, what shall I say, bloody the mood, sadly. But, uh, uh, you know, Sindh, no history. The frontier, till the end. Ghaffar uh, Khan was sitting here, you know, and saying, why we betrayed us, asking the Congress. No, I, th I think uh, th there's also this question of whether, in the end, partition was a direct consequence to a knee-jerk reaction to a series of very cataclysmic events which took place between 46 and 47 beginning with the direct action day. And MJ is quite right in pointing out that as far as Sindh and uh, Punjab and even the frontier was concerned, the hold of the Muslim League in those areas was tenuous. And it really didn't establish itself till 1946. One of the reasons why in uh, subsequently in post-independence uh, yeah. post Pakistan, they found their political stability so fragile. The, the really the bizarre thing and the irony of the whole situation that those who supported the Muslim League most avidly, who were the most avid supporters of Muhammad Ali Jinnah for his homeland, for Indian Muslims, actually came from Uttar Pradesh, some in Bihar, some in Madhya Pradesh, some in Tamil Nadu, no, which never, I don't think in their wildest dreams, if they actually rationally thought about the whole thing, they actually were in any way going to be uh, thing. I, I, I might point out a uh, rather thing. One of the greatest supporters of the Pakistan idea in Bengal was an Urdu-speaking Muslim, a man of considerable industrial fame and fortune, <laughs> a chap called <laughs> M.A.H. Ispahani. Uh, <laughs> very, you know, very good industrialist. He was one of the most elite industrialists. of, mm. the, And he was one of the big principal backers of, of Jinnah. Uh, some years ago, in a European capital, I encountered a very close, um, I will not, not elaborate, a very close descendant of uh, M.A.H. Espahani who asked me gently whether it was possible that if, if a PIO, as they, 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 they were called in those days, card could be issued. So I think, I think you know, the I, wheel I has think, turned a full circle. Yeah, I I we, we'll, I, we'll talk about no names, but we'll... Yes, but uh, having said that, it's again just to get text and context in some relationship with each other. You must remember that we have just mentioned the 46 elections. We just mentioned 37 elections. In both these elections, the electorate was only 10%. The electorate was an elite electorate. Nawab uh, Liaquat Ali Khan, the first prime minister of Pakistan, Jinnah's closest aide and so on, his bridge partner and much else, uh, you know, they were socially very uh, Western-oriented gentlemen. They, uh, he actually in 37 was fighting on the agriculturalist party, which was a landlord party. So it was rich. And I tell you, this is why till today in Pakistan, there's no land reform. Because they represented the landed interests, the leftover of the Nawab Zadas, and so on. And they were frightened of the promise of land reform in India. And because they were frightened of the economic upheaval that has to accompany, because without economic equity, you cannot have uh, a nation. Uh, you know, you cannot have a, uh, a Zamidari uh, nation. They, this frightened them and drove them into the language of hysteria using, you know, arguments that could not stand the test of history. But um, I mean, let's, 
I mean, we're talking about the 10%. I mean, I'll get, get you to ask the question finally. Uh, talking about the 10% who was the electorate of those days, I think it's very interesting to re re recall also that most of those who migrated from uh, the places which didn't become part of Pakistan uh, inevitably happened to be from the middle classes. And the upper classes. Uh, and, and the, yeah, but well, more the middle class. The British you know, the, middle class. So that was became one of the great liabilities of Muslim society after independence yeah, within India. That you started off without a middle class. Hmm. And that middle class is only now just Beginning about getting to, to be formed. So that was a big gap. And I think that was a big uh, setback for in Indian Muslims, I, I think, overall. I think apart from Bengal, where really a Muslim elite didn't really exist, except in a very small sort of way, in everywhere else, it was really the loss of that middle class leadership. After all, remember, AMU, which was at the heart of the Pakistan movement, Aligarh, was a modernist movement within the context. It was it was oh, again, it, it was quite been. against the Deobandis, which were the orthodoxies. But, the so, the, but therefore, the loss of that AMU alumni to Pakistan actually created the space for the more conservative and orthodox sections of Muslims to prevail in India post-47. And Laudi, since it's going to be an evening of ironies, the Devan movement wanted united India. Absolutely. 1936 elections, 37, Muhammad, 37. Uh, 37 elections, Muslim uh, independent party had 20 uh, candidates. Three of the Congress uh, candidates won because of MIP support. And this completely routed the league. The question that I'm really trying to ask is that why were these leaders not a part of the final negotiation on partition? You know, the final negotiations on partition, by the way, were taken over by Jinnah. And Jinnah wanted to be the sole spokesman. That was, he didn't allow Sir Sikandar Ayat Khan. Sir Sikandar Ayat Khan and his sons and family, who were the leaders of the largest province in the country, which was Punjab. Punjab existed from the border of uh, Delhi right up to Khaibar. Right? Of course, with princely states inside, sure. But that was its extent. And uh, in fact, the original dream of Pakistan was that it would reach here. And they were saying whether Aligarh should be included in it, in it or not. But the la final phase, which uh, actually Jinnah began to craft from 42, 43, and he knew the contradictions. And he knew he had to defeat the contradictions in order to get somebody to accept a completely irrational idea. And uh, then he, they, he removed all the other Muslim leaders and became what is known Aisha Jalal's book, title, which is the sole spokesman, and that is what he was. The, uh, I think uh, this point of whether uh, Pakistan would be good for Muslims or not, there is a very interesting conversation, and I might, why not, put a gentle plug for my own book. Which is, the whole details are there in Gandhi's Hinduism, the struggle against Jinnah's Islam, the exact, the whole conversation. Now, Mountbatten is having one of his last conversations just before. There is no dispute in anyone's mind that partition is going to happen. Right? So that phase is over. I would still like to talk about 46 if we get a chance because I think the decision that was made by Jawaharlal Nehru in July 46 before direct action contributed significantly. It was a, a blunder which nobody has been able to explain. Right? And why he held that press conference after the cabinet mission plan and so on. And I'm sure people who are listening today you will be absolutely fascinated by the events of May, June and July 46. But to get back to uh, this conversation with Mountbatten asks Jinnah that, uh, look, please explain to me why you want Pakistan. He says, you've got according to the plan that was worked out, Group A, Group B, Group C, you know, by the cabinet. He said, you've got your majority provinces. You've got the whole of Bengal, right? Maybe not Assam, uh, although that was, you know, there was a discussion and it was being disputed whether it should be tagged on to Bengal or not. And But I'm sure Assam would have been separate. He said, you've got the whole of Punjab, you've got Sindh, you've got Frontier, you've got Balochistan, right? 
you've got a vast population in UP. Nobody can sort of uh, uh, nobody can bully you, you know, with these populations in UP and Bihar. Why precisely do you want Pakistan? And he had no answer. He says, how is the economy better? It's a very simple question. You get your country. How do you make the economy? Religion doesn't give jobs. Right? The, how do you get geopolitically better? But on the other hand, look at the strength of India as a united country. Right? From Gwadar to Chittagong. Right? Who would have been in control of the geopolitics of the seas? And so on and so forth. I could label that point. Uh, May I just thing. add a just, thing? Uh, just to, because it's important. And then Mountbatten, maybe that's why they dislike him so much. He says, tells Jinnah that you are a psychopath. Now calling somebody a psychopath is not... Uh, then in the weekly report that the Viceroy sent to London, Right? If you can say, oh, it was a casual remark, maybe made in the heat of the moment and so on, all right. But he repeats the remark that this is an act of a psychopath who wants to cut up for the sake of cutting. And I think uh, history is evidence that perhaps there was something in what he said. You know, since we're going into the counterfactual of what, what if, uh, may I just say something which might appear to be completely heretical? Jinnah really gained his maximum strength between 1939 to 1946. That was the time when Jinnah Muslim League grew out from being a, just a provincial body to becoming a national force. In hindsight, one of the reasons why this happened was because the field had been vacated by all other political forces because of their participation in the Quit India movement. So there was a completely empty terrain in which the Muslim League, with the aid of the British administration, could actually move in and without any real challenge, posit the Muslim community and also as, as being the great defender of India and therefore get a lot of benefits and that there was sort of the, the, the appeal which he managed to extend his reach all over India at that time was quite significant. I mean, if you go back and look at that period, you will find that the only person who was really active in the political sphere at that time was uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah and to a lesser extent or in, in a different sort of way, the communists. And Subhash Chandra Bose. Subhash Chandra Bose was out of out India. Out of the country. But, out of the country. But, but uh, I will uh, defer with uh, on here because I think Gandhi in jail <coughs> was always more powerful than Gandhi outside jail because the emotional content quotient sorry that he represented while inside was absolutely beyond British belief and whenever he tested it through his past after all he was testing you know the strength of the British Empire to let him die right over and over again, the British, even in his last fast, the British succumbed. They would not be able to take the risk. Before, in 42, there was a plan, as if there was much earlier, to send him into exile. Some people were suggesting that to send him to southern Africa, I don't know which country, I think maybe Tanganyika or something, or to Aden, right? Keep in exile and throw him out. And the the, the <coughs> governors said, we won't be able to handle the reaction. Right? Now, the mistake, the sense, this is the season of mild heresy, uh, the mistake that Gandhiji made, which I have said that his biggest mistake, he tried to reach the Indian Muslims through Jinnah, rather than reaching Jinnah through Indian Muslims. And that, unfortunately, gave the Jinnah a legitimacy while the others were in jail which was through the, I think, 17 or 20 number of times that he went to Jinnah's residence. And you should see the governor's remarks before, during and after, particularly in Punjab and in the frontier. 
and they are saying that uh, before he went, Jinnah was not much of a factor in these areas. And after Gandhi ji gave him Qaidiyazam status, a Qaidiyazam a term, by the way, that was given by one of his uh, lady devotees, uh, Abdul uh, Salam, I think her name was. And the one person who was very angry about this was, of course, Azad. He kept saying over and over again, what is he doing? What is he doing? This was one factor that uh, actually established Jinnah. Because once Gandhi had recognized him as the leader of the Muslims, during this fallow period, and I'm sure there are, you know, uh, everything cannot be put in very neat boxes in this fallow period, that helped definitely his credibility enormously. And the second, of course, now we must go back to the cabinet mission. After the war, which Churchill had won, the British people exhibited a maturity which has no parallel democratic politics. They uh, threw out the man who had won the Second World War. I mean, it was a massive sweep. Attlee, who was his number two, became prime minister. In February, I think 22nd February or something like that, 46, Clement Attlee made a speech which absolutely changed the dynamics of the whole freedom struggle. He made a statement saying, we will not allow, maybe he said, I will not allow a minority to hold the majority hostage. Because Jinnah's deal with the British had been made in 1940 through the August offer, in which Jinnah actually the bargain that he made with the British, that he would help mobilize and recruit Muslims for the British army, which the British for very perfectly understandable reasons, and they wanted bodies, troops, you know, I don't, you know, we're not in the business of passing on blame and so on. But they made a deal, and in return, I will have a definitive say in the constitution making process, right? That was the agreement. So in the end, what Jinnah wanted would have to be wanted. This is Churchill's basic commitment. Lilnitko, Wavell, Churchill. When Atlee comes, he changes the dynamic. Then he sends the three-member cabinet mission. He cut a long story short. The first time ever, previous efforts at Shimla had failed and so on. First time ever, by the end of June, both the Congress and the Muslim League, through their working committees, endorse and pass an agreement on a united India. Now, this is astonishing. The headlines, I've seen the headlines of the time. The newspapers are bursting with joy that we've saved, we are saved. Right? This country shall remain united. Now, then an AICC is called, as per the Congress uh, rules, to ratify. Now, every AICC just ratifies a working committee. There is nothing beyond a working committee resolution. During that period, Jawaharlal is appointed Prime Minister, uh, appointed Congress President. Azad has to give way because the time is now for the formation of an interim government and so on and so forth. And Jawaharlal being the nominated heir of Gandhiji, for reasons we don't have to get into, but are rather thin. But however, they uh, you know, he's made the Congress president. As Congress president, he holds a press conference in Bombay saying that the Congress has not committed to anything. The Congress Working Committee is stunned. Azad makes remember, Sardar, uh, in a letter which is written, I think, to D.N. Mishra about 10 days later, says that this is emotional insanity. How can others plead with Jawaharlal to withdraw that statement? And he says, no, this will be the, uh, the, what is the respect or something of the Congress party's president will be lowered. I mean, we are talking about the future of a nation. We are not talking about an individual's respect. And this was called by Azad the historical blunder in the 30 pages of documents which he did not release when his book came out. He said only 30 years after my death they will be released. And anyway, this, give Jinnah the opening to where to repudiate. He no, was lo lo looking for that was, uh, Just to complete the point, this gave Jinnah the chance to call for direct action. 
on 15th, 14th August, 15th August in Bengal, resulting in the great Calcutta killings, then resulting in Noakhali, resulting in Bihar. After that, of course, I don't think there was any realistic. But there is no explanation from anyone as to why that press conference was first made and then condoned. This whole uh, conversation on, again, as I said, Nehru, Jinnah and uh, Gandhi, this over-dominance of these three figures in the partition narrative. And clearly, Sa uh, Savarkar, Ambedkar, uh, Patel, all these national figures are completely absent. I want to take you back to Bengal. Um, early 20th century Bengal, that's when the first so seeds of partition perhaps were sowed. But somehow the entire nation along with Bengal came together to annul that, uh, that, that act. What happened in the later 30 years that as a nation we couldn't, we couldn't put up a formidable force in front of either Nehru or Jinnah or whoever, uh, as uh, MJ Akbar says, the colossal mistake of partition and as Nehru called it, the fantastic nonsense. Why couldn't we as a society come up with a counter? Well, I think there are three or four things which happened in the interim between 1911 and 1947. One was the shift of the capital from Calcutta to mm -hmm. Delhi, which reduced the political importance of Bengal and became Bengal rather than became at the center of politics, became a province. So that was an important shift. Secondly, an epidemic of communal riots. An epidemic of communal riots, really, every place. And most of them were on this rather abstruse question of music before mosques. Yeah. Oh, well, something similar. <laughs> you know, the, Which is all the, deliberate mischief. You know, so th that was the, the thing. The third was the communal award. The, the, uh, the thing which was by which the electorates were decided on the strength of whether you were Hindu or whether you were Muslim. Yeah, no, that is the, 1908. Yes, I know no, much later. The whole communal award, the proportions were... Oh, you mean 32 communal 32 com communal award. But that which actually... Gave disproportionate... Uh, sizes in legislature. Which gave a certain thing and which actually set the Bengali elite, the Bhadralok elite, really against the Muslims. And I think that schism, that emotional schism which was developed in, in those areas and then you come, then you have a lot of things whereby a lot of uh, issues which were very sacred to the Bengali Bhadraloks at that point, the Calcutta University and things like that. Minor changes here and there, change of the emblem. They sound rather petty at this point, you know, in the hindsight, but it created. And so, when the 46 riots, the direct action day took place, the biggest demand of the Bengali intelligentsia was, how do we save, how do we extricate a part of Bengal from Pakistan, from going to Pakistan. That became their form. So in other words, where, what Curzon had tried to do in 1905, now the Bengalis said for their own, Bengali Hindus said for our own self-preservation, we need to create a West Bengal because we don't want to go to Pakistan any, any, any longer. And, you know, that became, that, uh, one of the things was that the Congress at that time was almost in denial about the partition in the East. Yes. I'll give you a very small example of that. In 1948, a delegation of Bengali Hindus who had been turfed out of what was then East Pakistan went to the Congress session in, I think it was in Jaipur, and went to meet Jawaharlal Nehru, then the Prime Minister, and said, we've come to talk about rehabilitation. And he said, where are you from? He said, they, they said, we've come from East Pakistan. He said, don't talk to me. Go and talk to the Foreign Affairs Department of the AICC. So the whole point which was believed at that particular point was that East, the partition in the East hadn't happened. That it would somehow, it would, a status quo would be maintained and there would be no transfer of population that, you know, by and large, whatever disturbances in 46 had been done would be settled, would, would more or less settle in 47, and only the very elite would, le would leave from uh, East Pakistan to West Bengal. Now, that didn't happen. It happened in dribs and drabs. And I think that's the untold story of, uh, the forgotten story of partition, that it didn't happen in one fell swoop 
in 1947. Yeah, population that, the, 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 the movement of yeah, population. Is, the the movement of population really took place and continued. And it, in, in fact, it reached a peak in 1971, 65, 71. 65. Uh, and then, and it's, it's more or less continuing on a daily basis even now. The last time I went to Dhaka, I was told in the uh, Dhakeshwari Mandir, which was there, that on an average, about 40 families leave, and these days more middle class, they leave for West Bengal from Bangladesh. So that legacy, the persisting legacy of what took place in 1947 hasn't been healed despite 1971, the, the formation you know, of Bangladesh. I hope we don't run out of time because uh, we can't have a, a discussion on the legacy of partition without saying one of the major legacies of partition is war on Jammu and Kashmir. You know? <laughs> but that apart, to get back to Bengal, very, the reason why there was no immediate transfer of populations, uh, unlike Punjab, where it happened, you know, it was driven, was because of Gandhiji. Gandhiji did not want to be in India on 15th August, 1947. Why? Not because he didn't believe in India, because he didn't believe in Pakistan. He had fought a bitter battle with his own side, right? Eventually, it's a very sad story. He was on his way to Noakhali. And in Calcutta, a delegation including Saravarti said that we will guarantee peace in Noakhali, but we will not be able to maintain peace in Calcutta if you are not here. And because of that, he remained. And then, in what he did, which statesmen described as a miracle, how he single-handedly changed the atmosphere. The statesman's reporting of this period I've read intensely of 15th, 14th August. And then on what he did, and then he, he, there was again, there's kind of riots which Chopin was talking about, again broke out. He had to go on a fast. And during the fast, he said, I will only break my fast when Shama Prasad Mukherjee tells me to, uh, that all is peaceful and so on. And eventually, you know, things were brought under control by the political class, not by the people. And Mountbatten famously sent him a letter saying that in Punjab I have a 55,000 men, border force, and they cannot keep a single peace. In Calcutta there is one man. And he has maintained the peace. Think about it now. That why did the Muslims living in the border districts of East Pakistan, then, then East Pakistan, today's situation of course is Bangladesh, then East Pakistan, the border districts are still heavily populated by Muslims. They didn't go. They didn't go because there was peace. In fact, the real riot started after 1950. And then they peaked again in, 60, in 64, 63, 64. And as he said, it was 64 to 71, which saw the back to this, uh, these migrations. Um, again, this whole, uh, I'm taking you back to the frontier states, which actually suffered the brunt of partition the most. Maybe, Neh as, and, and you lucidly explained how Nehru actually propelled Jinnah to, to the image that he has. Uh, well, not propel Jinnah. But he created the opportunity, I mean, right. just to choose words carefully. Right, right. Why didn't Gandhi, with Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, or Gopinath Bordoloi in Assam, and, uh, and to a great extent Assam is a part of India today because of uh, Gandhiji's okay. intervention. Yes, yes. So why, why could he not come to terms with these Muslim leaders who, had, who could have given a formidable opposition? To yes, I agree with you. Why did he not come to terms with, uh, the, uh, with the Unionist Party in Punjab? Let's take Punjab where this was, disease was, had its worst consequences. And as I said, instead of reaching out to Jinnah through Muslims, he was reaching out to Muslims through Jinnah. And I said that earlier, that if I find one political mistake that he made, in all this complex time, it was perhaps this. He, he gave credibility to Jinnah. If he had given the same credibility to the Hayat Khan or to, you know, whoever, right? Uh, and by the time he reached out to Sarvardi, it was all too late. Sarvardi was, had been accused and admitted 
before 1447, in uh, August 47, he admitted that he had been responsible for the Calcutta killings because he was then Chief Minister Stroke, Prime Minister, as they used to say it then, of Bengal. I mean, we have very two different narratives of partition. One is the belief that partition was a consequence of events, developments, missed opportunities which took place at best from 1937 and culminated in 1947 and therefore the period in which that is the period to examine and probe very deeply. And we, we are fortunate that we've got a wealth of papers and oh, documents. The, the British documents. The, the, the documents which are there. There is another view of partition, however, that this reflects a larger schism, more civilizational schism and a different perception which absolutely surfaced in 47. It hadn't surfaced in 47, it would have surfaced sometime later. And that it would have been unmanageable. Had that, you know, the, the, the formulation of the cabinet mission plan been actually accepted, that it would have been unmanageable. That, in, the, in, in a sense, that they, despite the hardships, despite the bloodshed, everything, India's growth story today is a consequence which would have been, it, that wouldn't have taken place had partition not happened. You know, this is, a, this is another alternative narrative which I think is, is also worth considering. And I don't think we'll get a finality to no, any of get. these things. However, and, uh, and the point is that, uh, point is, after, since 1947, as you said, with, a, with lots of hits and a few misses, we have traveled a long way. And we've created a certain element, which, uh, we've created a structure in India whereby we are basically tried to gloss over some of the deeper wounds of partition. And we've tried, not always very successfully, but we've tried. And I think that's a very important thing. On the other hand, Pakistan hasn't even tried. Uh, let's go with the evidence in 47 before the de generation taking decisions. The best government that Punjab has ever had was between 37 and 46 by a, by a coalition of uh, Hindus, Sikhs and Muslims. Right. So the fact that you know uh, these so-called civilizational traits would inevitably lead to some kind of later schisms may or may not. I mean, we can't say definitively what would have happened. But the evidence says that no, given a chance, They've, just as you know, Hindus and Muslims have lived for so long, they would have found a way, particularly since in a democratic system, they would have had more freedom of expression than they've ever had under feudalism of one kind or the other. The second uh, is, I must tell you this story, which when Gandhiji in his own way uh, was trying to answer the same point, because Jinnah used to make this point fervently, we are separate people, we are separate country, we don't have anything in common and so on and so forth. He used to say, he told Jinnah during these talks that, you know, when I first saw you, I thought you were a Hindu. Right? And then, a point that he would make over and over again, some people may like it, some people may not, but this is part of the Gandhi narrative. He said, what is an Indian Muslim? An Indian Muslim is only a Hindu who has been converted. By which he meant that you belong to this cultural ethos of this land. You have at some moment in your history, adopted another religion. So what? That doesn't change the fact that you are an Indian. And then he tells Jinnah that I thought you were a Hindu. And then he adds, very interestingly, that when I first saw Vital Bhai, which is Sardar's brother, I thought Vital Bhai was a Muslim. Because Vital Bhai used to wear that face occasionally and had a beard. What he was trying to make was the larger point that the Indian ethos is an assimilative ethos. The Indian ethos has actually created over a long period of history uh, the story of amalgam, which doesn't mean there are no differences, no frictions, no tensions, of course there are. But we have a chance of creating something together. I thank both of you for this amazing conversation. Uh, I'm sure it has given us a lot of moment to pause and reflect on the journey by far. Thank you once again. Thank you so much. Huh? Thank you very much.